All right, Genesis 3 for a starting place this morning. Genesis chapter 3. This morning and again tonight, we will study the nature of temptation. The nature of temptation. I don't suppose there's any series of verses that I have taught more frequently through the years than these because they're always applicable to every one of our lives. Until we leave this world, we will be tempted. (laughs) Tempted to sin, that would be the most simplistic way to say it. Tempted to harm ourselves by disobeying God would be a more uh, explanatory way to say it. Tempted to show the Lord that we prefer Satan to our Savior is the reality of the matter. God put that man and woman in that garden, gave them everything, including himself. Satan offered them one thing, one thing, and they turned from all that God had given them. How, what a heartbreaking thing from God's vantage point. And we, we sing about and we testify about, and, and if, if we're honest in our conversation, we, we tell one another... All the ways God's been so good to us. And the devil says, yeah, but wouldn't you like to have this? And we just push God and all his blessings aside and go after that. It just repeats itself over and over and over again in our lives. The Bible says in Genesis 3 verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yay, he's so positive. Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of of every tree of the garden, casting doubt upon what God had said? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So he comes with a positive message, Yay! And then he comes casting doubt upon the word of God, and then he comes denying That the word of God is true. The word of God is correct. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, here's what he didn't tell her. God's little g. You know what that is in your Bible? It's fallen creatures cast out of heaven because of their rebellion against God. See, when when the devil said you'll be as gods, he's, he's, he's right. They will. You'll be a fallen creature cast out of God's presence, having lost fellowship with God. But when she heard it, because she's not trusting God, when she heard it, she interpreted it as as being a big capital G on there. I'm going to be just as much God as God is, instead of being just as much a worm as this devil is. And so the scripture says, verse 6, when the woman saw... That the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also her husband with her and he did eat. And down went the race into sin and death and sorrow and tears and destruction. Father, help us. We've come to church this morning to get some help. And we need the help you have to offer in your word regarding These matters, give us ears to hear, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Genesis 1, go back there just for a moment, Genesis 1, God has created all that pertains to Adam and to Eve in six literal days. At the end of each day, the Bible said God looked at what he had made and said it was good. And verse 31, Genesis 1, 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, what's what's hanging upon that tree in the garden is the knowledge of good and evil. The plants, Genesis 1, are good. 
The animals, Genesis 1, are good. The sunlight is good. The shining stars are good. The, the, the man, the woman, they're good. The fellowship relationship with God, it's good. Everything is good. So what does the woman have to gain by yielding to that temptation? Only the knowledge of evil. Everywhere she looks, it's good. Everything she experiences is good. Everything God made for her is good. The, the devil is offering her insight into pain, insight into suffering, an understanding of sorrow and shame and guilt, and she doesn't see it that way. Why? Because she's entertaining the tempting words of the serpent, rather than standing in her heart upon the truth of God's word, rather than confidently abiding in a relationship with God. Now you tell me what's changed from that day to this. You have a good God and a good Savior. You have a good salvation. You have a good eternal destiny. You have a good word to guide you. You have a, a good church to attend and good brothers. And so, Listen, your life is so filled with good that you couldn't name all the good things you enjoy in the course of a day. And here comes the devil. Look at that woman. Why can't you drink that? What's wrong with those words? Well, who says going there is a bad thing? Why in the world do we continue to allow ourselves to be allured by that which God hasn't given to us because it's only evil, while being so discontented with all the good things that He has given us? Whatever I'm lusting after, it's a testimony. I don't like what I have. Whatever I'm longing for that God's forgiven, I'm saying to God, but you haven't been good enough to me. Because I want that. And the devil, he just, he just sits in a tree in everyone's yard and says, but you'll be happier if you commit adultery. But you'll be happier if you tell that lie. But you'll be happier if you indulge in that lust of the flesh. But you'll be happier if you continue to give into that habit or that addiction. You know what he's saying? Tell God he's not good enough. Tell God his blessings don't satisfy. You need sin. Come on, you, you can, you can water it down if you want to. You can pretty it up if you want to. But that's the fact of the matter. God gave me this wife, but I want his wife. God gave me all these things to eat. God gave me all these things to drink, but I want to drink the one thing the Bible tells me not to drink. And you know what you'll find? You'll find a serpent in a tree who'll tell you that's not what really God really said. That's just that preacher. That's just that Bible. And what, how do you know the Bible's right anyway? You just go right ahead and do it. Satan has never had to change his method of operation because it's never failed to work. Look in your Bible in Romans 14 and Titus chapter 1. Romans 14 and Titus chapter number 1. I'm going to use obvious examples this morning. Could use a thousand. Romans 14, Titus chapter 1. Romans 14 and verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Please don't, 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 don't let me be inappropriate this morning. I'm not trying to be inappropriate. I'm, I'm trying to show you the, the extent of this thing. A precious, beautiful little child is no Darwinian accident. 
That's a testimony of the glory and the honor and the majesty of God. That God could create in the womb of a woman all those fingers and toes and eyes and ears and nose and all those internal organs and everything working together perfectly and out comes this little bitty baby. Mother loves that baby and daddy ought to love that baby and the baby grows to a toddler and now a little child, little boy, little girl uh, running about the house. Could anything be more precious? So, how depraved do you have to be to molest that? How depraved do you have to be to view that as an object of your perverted affections? You understand, man could take the greatest marvel of God's creation and turn it into the greatest crime imaginable because man's depraved. God God puts all these plants in the ground and, and there's one you can make rope with and you can make paper with and you can make boxes with. Or you could set it on fire and rob yourself of your sobriety. Right. Now, what does the devil want you to do? He wants you to say to God, Thank you for my life. Thank you for my mind. Thank you for my health. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Thank you for offering me a hope of eternal life. Thank you for a husband or a wife. Thank you for children. Thank you for grandchildren. But why can't I get drunk? I don't know. Why do you have to get drunk when God has given you so many wonderful things in your life? What is it that makes people walk right past every tree in the garden and head for the one tree that will harm them? Because there's a devil. And he wants to tempt you to sin so that, so that the sin can hurt you. But he also ultimately wants to tempt you to sin so he can say to God, You see, if you'd have let me on the throne, everybody would be happier. Because everybody down there on that planet prefers my way to your way. Watch, I'll prove it to you. And there he goes. It's not about the, it's not about the, the tobacco habit. It's not about the alcohol. It's not about the pornography. It's not about the rebellion. It's not, it's Satan wanting to say to God, look, after everything you did for them, they prefer me every time. If you'd put it up to a vote, you'd put Satan on the throne, not Christ. That's what the devil wants. He wants to take that which is pure, everything God made, and and turn it into something impure. How does he do that? By defiling the hearts and minds of sinners with sin. And when you put it in those terms... Well, I don't see, where the Bible say you have to repent? How can you not repent? How can a man understand how many times he has allowed Satan to use him to strike a blow against the heart of a holy God and not just feel so ashamed? Lord, I'm so sorry. I let the devil use me to insult you. That's what it's all about what it comes down to. Come to James chapter 1 in the Bible. We're in the Bible. James 1 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. James chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You know these modern ministers telling congregations that God doesn't care if you sin, He loves you anyway. I hope they don't apply that philosophy to their marriage Well, my, my wife loves me. I'll just, I'll just commit horrible acts against her all day long, and she loves me. What a sick way to look at life. Okay, so God loves me. Why would I take the love of the one person in all this universe who cared enough to die for me, and why would I abuse that love by flaunting the fact that I can sin and he'll still love me? Kids, listen, I, you, your mom and dad, well, your dad might reach a limit, but your mom, she'll never reach that limit. 
No matter what you do in this world, she'll love you. So why would you drag her heart and life through the mud just because she'll still love you? Why wouldn't you live to please her? I don't get this modern thing. These guys stand in the pulpit. Well, yo, Jesus loves you no matter what. Yeah, he loves you no matter what. So straighten up. (laughs) Why treat someone who loves you like people are being encouraged to treat the one who loves them? Shameful. It's shameful. James chapter 1 says this. Verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted. Got that? When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So, why would God tempt me to move away from God? He won't. Why would I be tempted to move away from God? And this is what you got to get, brother. This is what you got to get, sister. No matter how long you've been saved, the Bible's true. No matter how long you've served God, the Bible is true. So in you is a desire to move away from God. That's what he said. He said every one of us is tempted, right? Everyone is tempted... When we are enticed by our own lust. So sitting here this morning with a Bible in your lap, in church on a Sunday, having sung praise to God, you have to know there is something in you that wants to stop serving God, stop reading the Bible, stop living by God's word. You have to acknowledge that. Because it is that Lust of the flesh, not for something, but against God that Satan plays upon. So how do you know it's not lust for something, but against God? Because your temptations are not my temptations. I don't understand your temptations. I don't. Listen, I'm not being critical. I'm not. Because I've been told by men that were cocaine addicts, that they could quit coke and they couldn't quit smoking cigarettes. So I, I'm not, not I, just me personally, I don't get it. I don't see how in the world that you get up in the morning and the first thing you want to do is set something on fire and inhale the smoke that stinks like that. I don't get it. But what I fall for, you don't get that. How can that guy preach like that, know the Bible like that, and, and, and do what he does? You say, what is it? I ain't telling you. <laughs> the, the, the fact of the matter is, we don't all lust for the same thing. But we all lust for the same reason. Saved or not, read the Bible or not, Go to church or not, there is something inside you that says, God is not going to run my life. Now, how silly is that? He can run the stars, I can set my watch by them. He can run the universe, I know that summer is going to follow spring every year, I know that. No matter how scared Al Gore gets, it's, it's, coming there's going to be fall and, and winter and all the rest of it that's just that's just how it's going to be everything that god is allowed to run without interference runs perfectly and every one of our lives is filled with imperfections and yet we continue to think our problem is that god is too controlling see so when the devil comes to me and the devil comes to you He doesn't have to create something in me to work upon. It's already there. Don't you wish that wasn't so? But it is. All right, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And watch how this thing works. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. (laughs) 
You know, when you stand, it doesn't matter what you preach. We'll sing three songs. Um, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. And then we'll sing, take my life and let it be. And then we'll sing, the Bible stands like a rock undaunted. Then the preacher gets up and begins to preach on something that I don't like. And all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus, I don't trust him. Don't take my life and let it be. And the Bible falls. We mean those songs when we're singing them. But as soon as the preacher opens the Bible and says, here's what God wants you to do. Well, let's see why I have to do that. Here's what God told you to stop doing. Well, I don't see what's so wrong with that. I know a lot of people that are Christians, they do that. Look, do you not understand? If we have that attitude after singing hymns and praying while a preacher's preaching, what attitude do we have Monday at work? <laughs> Come on, it's in us. Who is this God to tell me what to do? And then you say, well, no, it's, it, here it is right here in the Bible. That's just your opinion. I didn't give any opinion. I just read the verse. Well, I don't think that's what that means. You know who we're saying that to? The one who sent his son to die to pay for our sins. How do we doubt his love? How do we doubt his having our best interest at heart? But we do. It's amazing. So the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Now that sounds contradictory, but it's not. You just said we don't all have the same temptation. Yes, but we all have temptation in common. There's no one here that is not tempted. And there's no one here who is not tempted in the same way, though we might be tempted by a different color trinket. Come on, look. James 1. Here I am. I'm lost. I'm not saved yet. But I know in my heart there's a God to whom I'm accountable. What's, the Satan, what's Satan want me to do? He wants me to move from there into evolution or atheism or some religion that says God doesn't know, God doesn't care. All he wants me to do is move away from God. If you're here this morning and you're saved, what does Satan want you to do? He just wants you to move away from God. Doesn't matter what I preach. If I said, you know what, we really ought to, we really ought to uh, uh, give more to God, you'd say, the Bible doesn't say I have to give. The Bible doesn't say you have to go to restaurants. And if I said tithing, somebody would come and say, well, Brother James, you, you, you showed us a tithing not in the New Testament. If God had said 9%, you'd argue for 8 Look, I'm telling you, it's not the commandment. It's not the rule. What we all have in common is we resent being told what to do. We resent being told what we can't do. And it doesn't matter if it's our loving, all-powerful, all-wise God who's giving the commandments. I should be on the throne. So when Satan comes to tempt me, there's something in me that feels the same way about God that he does. We all have that in common. And so we all have to be not only aware of that, but on absolute guard against it at all times. Watch. Verse 13. There are no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. That is great news. That's great news. If you're here this morning, okay, here I am. I, I, I'm in this spot, right here, next to God, and Satan wants me to move. And Satan comes with a temptation, and God said, 
Here's my promise to you. I, I, I say this in good faith. I'm God. I cannot lie. I say this to you. Whatever that temptation is, I will not allow it to be anything you cannot refuse. See that? See what he said? God's faithful. I'm not, but God is. God knows I've already got this inclination in my heart to turn against him and go the devil's way. But God wants to help me. He wants to prop me up. He wants to keep me from falling. So he says to the devil, you can go that far, but not any farther. Isn't that great news? There will be nothing prevent, presented to me this week to which I cannot say no. Hallelujah. That's great news. No, it's terrible news. Because it means every time I have ever sinned, it was my willful choice to do so. I cannot blame the devil. I cannot blame that woman or that man or that circumstance or or that economy or the president because God said you could have withstood that temptation had you wanted to. But you didn't want to. So the man says to his wife, you know, I I, I know I told you I wasn't going to gamble anymore, but I just couldn't help it. Liar. The woman says, I know I told you I wasn't going to treat you that way anymore, but I just can't help it. Liar. The child says, well, mom, mom, you know, it's just, I just, you know, I, I just, I just couldn't help it. Liar. Is that too, is that too harsh? <laughs> Stop blaming the serpent in the tree and get away from the tree. <laughs> Here, Eve, eat this. Her arms and legs can go his direction or turn and go God's direction. He didn't shove that fruit in her mouth. She took it. She ate it. She held it out to Adam. And Adam said, it's a woman's fault. And the woman said, it's a serpent's fault. And the serpent said, it's your fault. And God said, you're all guilty. Because you're not blaming me. Don't go home and tell your wife you couldn't help it. You could help it. Go and say, honey, you know what? I didn't want to help it. I just wanted to sin against you and God and everybody else. Forgive me and act like it never happened. Come on, that's... We wouldn't use those words, but that's what we expect. God, you know it's your fault. You made me too weak and you should have thrown the devil in a pit a long time ago and you should have just made my life where I don't have to make any choices. But then you'd curse God for making you a robot and being a dictator. God can't win. He wants you to love Him. That's what this thing's all about. Well, let's keep reading here. Not stuff you be tempted of that year. I'm going back to that church. That preacher called me a liar. No, that's not true. I said if you said your sin was not your fault, you're a liar. Now, if you've never said that, (laughs) then I wasn't talking about you. And if you have ever said that, I was talking about you, and that's what you are. That's what I am. That's what we all are. All right, but, now watch, but, will with the temptation, with, with the temptation, same time, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. All right, so here's, here's what God said. I'm standing right here. And the devil says, come on, come on, come on, sin. Come on, come on, leave God. Come on, turn your back on God and come follow me. And at the very time of that temptation, God the Holy Spirit says, no, no, turn over here. Right then. Right then. You know Bible verses? That's the time to use them. You know how to pray? That's the time to use it. You know how to run to God when you're in trouble? That's the time to run. You know what Christians have been trained to do by their ministers and by their own (laughs) watered-down conscience? We've been taught to go as far into sin with the devil as we can until until it starts to hurt. And then we use those Bible verses. 
And then we say those prayers. And then we want to run to God. Because we want the sin. We just don't want the wages of sin. So we want God to stay here like a faithful, abused wife. While we go out and run around with our mistress. And then when our mistress begins to mistreat us, we want to run back to our wife and tell her that God commands her to take us in because she's supposed to keep her vows. We said, well, that'd be a low-down thing to do. Okay, so I want God to stay right here while I go out and sin with the devil. And then when it starts costing me something, I want to run back to God and quote him verses about he's not supposed to ever leave me or forsake me and supposed to always love me. What a low-down way to live a Christian life. And the fact that it's being promoted in Christian pulpits and Christian TV and Christian bookstores doesn't make it any better. Yeah, I got a good husband. Well, where is he? Oh, he's sitting home. Why is he sitting home? Because he don't like this this uh, disco nightlife. He don't like this this uh, swapping partners every weekend night. Well, man, what a thing to do to a husband like that. Oh, he, he he'd never leave me. He's a good Christian man. What a low down way to treat somebody like that. Yeah. Said, so, boy, a woman like that, she stinks. How about Christians like that? What are you doing out here living like this? Oh, you know, it's grace. It's once saved, always saved. Lord loves me. Uh, you know, it, it, anytime things get really bad, I can just run to Him and He'll help me. Why are you out somewhere where you have to run to Him? Why don't you stay with Him? Why don't you abide with Him and dwell with Him and enjoy Him and sit at His feet and sit at His table and worship Him? Instead of saying, Lord, you stay right here with all your rules and your holiness and your your narrow way. I'm going to go out here and wallow in the pig pen with the devil. If I get smelling too bad, I'm going to come back home, okay? Because you know, like the prodigal son, you got to take me back. That's a lousy relationship. But it's fair to say that's the attitude of the modern Christian. Well, I don't see why there's anything wrong with it. That's because you're only looking at it, you, you look in the devil's way when you say that. Why don't you look God's way and say that? You can't look God's way and say, I don't see there's anything wrong with it. There's tears running down his face. <clears throat> 13. There had no temptation taken you, but such common demand. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. If you're going from here to, to uh, Orlando on Interstate 4 and you miss your exit, there's another one a mile, mile and a half down the road. We're out, we're out in New Mexico. There are places out there, I-25, you miss an exit? You got 60, 70 miles before there's any place to get off. Turn around, cross a medium, anything. You just, that's not a good thing. You've been in a big mess of traffic in a big city, and you, it, it's, it's five lanes, and you're all the way in the left lane, and you look up, and it says next exit, and it doesn't no way you're getting there. And you got, it, it takes you. 30 minutes to finally get over to the right lane and then you got to get you turn and come back oh it's it's a it's a it's a big mess it's a big you don't you don't you don't miss an exit in downtown Atlanta big mess big mess you know what god said when you're tempted i'll make a way of escape and if you don't take that exit it's going to be a long time before you get another one It'll be a long time Long time before you get another one. Teenagers. <laughs> Enjoy being as smart as you are for as long as you can. <laughs> so right now you don't need anybody's advice. I don't know what percentage of people who begin drinking become alcoholics. Nor do you know whether or not you are that one. Before you let some rebel kid 
talk you into trying your first beer, you better ask yourself, if I don't take this exit right now, how far down this road will I be till I get another chance to get off? Your next exit might be in a rescue mission or a rehab. Oh, you can't say that. No, I can't. And you can't say it won't be. Before you let that kid talk to you and taking that first pill, you better ask yourself, will I be the one that ends up frying his brains with dope? Nobody looked at their first pill and said, you know where I'm going to be 10 years from now? Neither do I. I won't even know where I am. I'm telling you, before you bypass the exit God provides for you, you better get out a map and look and see how far it might be till you can get off that road again. It might be a long way down that road. Young lady, he's sweet-talking you, telling you, you you can get around daddy's rules and sneak around mama's rules and they trust you. They won't check on you and all that kind of stuff. Listen, when he finds out you're pregnant, he can get in his truck and head on down the road. You got a baby. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you, you better take the exit God provides for you. Or you might go a lot farther down the road than you planned on going before you get a chance to get off the road again. You better, you better trust God. Better believe that Bible. You better take the way of escape. Before you leave church over your, your teenagers not liking the rules, you better go look at how far some people have driven their family down the road of, we don't want a church like that. Because that road did not stay as straight as they thought it would. That road did not stay as narrow as they intended it to stay when they walked away from a good church. That road got broad and twisted. And some of them still hadn't found the exit. There might not be another exit off that road. Well, 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 well. Take the way of escape. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. We can squeeze in two more verses this morning. Amen. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter 2. It did not benefit Eve to sin against God. It will not benefit me to sin against God. It will not benefit you. To sin against God. The devil will lie to you all day and all night and tell you that it will. You'll be happier, you'll be freer, you'll be He's a liar. Second Peter two, verse number nine. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Isn't that a blessing? Take the way of escape. What if I don't? And to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Here's all he said. If you don't take the way out, there's punishment down the road. You ought to trust God. You ought to trust God. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Tonight, Lord William, we'll consider the time when Jesus was tempted... That'd be a good place to go to learn how to handle temptation. Matthew 26. Verse 41. Jesus says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I'm going to stay with the right people. I'm going to surround myself with the, with the right situations. I'm going to try and stay real close to the Lord. And that way the devil won't get me. The men he's talking to. Two hours ago they're in an upper room with Jesus. He's breaking the bread. He's passing the cup. They're singing hymns together. They come out of the upper room with Jesus and they go into the Garden of Gethsemane and they are praying, Jesus is here, 
They're right there. They're right there. You tell me where you could be in a safer place. You tell me where you could be in a better situation or a better circumstance to not have the devil trick you into sinning or lure you into sinning than to have been with Jesus in the upper room and now you're with Jesus in a prayer meeting at Garden Gethsemane. And the Lord says to those men right there, you better watch. You better pray. You don't think the devil's bold enough to walk right in here to the Garden of Gethsemane and try and get you to take out a sword and, and fight when you're not supposed to be fighting? You don't think the devil's strong enough not walk right in the middle of this thing and get you to deny me three times before sunrise? For three and a half years, they walked with Jesus Christ and saw his miracles with their eyes. They heard his voice. They saw his face. They were his disciples. And he's on his knees praying, and the devil's right there messing with him, while Jesus Christ's right there on his knees. Well, I go to church, praise the Lord. I read my Bible every day, praise the Lord. Watch and pray that you are not in temptation. There's no place you'll ever go, the devil won't come after you. No place you'll ever be, the devil won't make a run at you. That's just what he does. Christians aren't consistent. Satan is. <laughs> so what do we do? We take the way of escape. We trust God. We watch and pray. All right. Last verse for this morning. Just in case by some tragic accident, some of you are not back tonight. James chapter number 1. Things happen. Things happen. James chapter 1. This verse is so convicting to me. Verse number 12, James 1, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. What an odd thing to say about temptation. But it concludes right where we began. What is the devil's purpose in tempting me? He wants to be able to say to God, see, he doesn't love you. And when, and when I can look at an offer of sin and take the way of escape because I don't want to dis. Please the Lord. What's the Bible say in James 1? I have just proved my love to God. So every temptation is not, it's not an offer made by Satan to get you to do A, B, or C. All temptation is common. It has one thing in common. Satan wants you to say to God, I don't love you. I want your heaven. I want your forgiveness. But I don't want you. I wish Satan could be my God. Because I like his way better than your way. But the end result of his way is really bad. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. So I came to God to get heaven because that's what I want. But I wish I could just follow Satan. That's really tough. But if you're a husband who's your wife, it's exactly how you'd look at it. Your wife who's your husband, it's exactly how you'd look at it. It's true. It's true. Oh, honey, I love you. Where are you going? I'm going out with, a, with, with, with my boyfriend. <laughs> what do you mean you love me? You don't love me. You want what I provide for you, but you don't love me. You'd rather be with him. You say, that's awful. It is. I hope you've never been through it. If you've been through it, you know how awful it is. Why do we do that to God? That's what temptation's all about. It's not the devil trying to get you to tell a lie. It's not the devil trying to get you to cheat somebody. It's not the devil trying... 
It's the devil wanting to run to God and say, See, nobody loves you. They'd follow me in a minute if it wasn't for hell. May the Lord help us to do better than that. May the Lord help us to show Him more from our heart. Amen? Amen. Father, this is a sobering thought for our Sunday morning. Lord, why is it we can't see all the harm and all the damage done by sin and run from it? Please, Lord, help every man this morning. Help every woman this morning. Help every young people, person this morning. Please, God, help us to deal honestly with the truths of these verses. And run to you before we sin, not after we've sinned. Please, Lord, teach us, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet and come and pray. Altar is open, number 364.